So I'm delighted to be joined by Michael Chiatto from a company called Genpact. Uh, welcome, Michael, nice to see you. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, okay. So uh, just to give a bit of background on, on Genpact, you, you're basically a, a supply chain uh, experts, essentially, uh, and, uh, and, and help uh, a lot of the tier one, uh, or sorry, tier one, the, the front end uh, wafer manufacturers and major companies uh, manage their supply chains and issues across the world. Yeah, uh, experts always high praise, but uh, within yeah. Genpack, we're about five billion dollar uh, business professional services firm that okay. supports consulting as well as run operations for our clients. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my responsibility is the supply chain service line, which is a team of about ten thousand people. Right. Um, and to your point, we support 17 of the 20 largest semiconductor companies across foundries, IDMs, fabrics, as well as equipment. Well, that's a huge footprint and a huge size of company already, so you must be experts in what you do. <laughs> I rely on my team to be the experts. <laughs> right, so. right, okay. Well, I mean, obviously it's been a very active time, I'm sure, for you, because, I mean, we've had a whole lot of geopolitical issues happening mm -hmm. across the supply chain. Um, tell us some of the strategies and some of the things you do uh, to, to help your, your customers navigate it. Absolutely. I would say uh, we could kind of bucketize it in three key areas. Mm -hmm. um, one of the key areas you mentioned is obviously around geopolitical risk and supply chain disruption. Right. So we help companies design resiliency in their supply chain network. Mm -hmm. uh, that can take the form of uh, nearshoring or diversification of supply sources, so finding secondary and tertiary sources of supply. Mm -hmm. In that area, we're helping clients uh, map the multi-tiers of their supplier network, so their tier one, tier two, tier three suppliers, identify areas in which there's uh, significant concentration to one mm -hmm. or two providers, and then help identify alternatives. And a lot of times we'll go in and do uh, value-based engineering to bring suppliers maybe to a different industry to be qualified to support the semiconductor industry in the space. And we'll partner with uh, capital allocation investment banks to help do that uh, right. development of the suppliers. So supplier development and risk mitigation is one key area. Uh, second key area is obviously building agility and responsiveness. So this is where we're working to try to connect enterprise systems, mm -hmm. leveraging technology and analytics to be a little bit more proactive yep. in identifying areas of volatility and risk, mm -hmm. and then building scenario structures to be able to run uh, cross-functional trade-offs mm -hmm. and make decisions closer to near, near real time uh, mm -hmm. with better information. Right. And then last but not least, we'll do a lot of long-term strategic planning or integrated business planning solutions that help companies work and plan two, three, four, five years out because as you know, uh, development in the semiconductor industry, building new fabs takes a long period of time. Yeah. So we're looking from a longer scale perspective as well. Okay, okay. So, so how much do you go into that um, risk mitigation factor? Because I mean, I know, uh, I, I work a little bit further down the food chain sometimes in, in the uh, in the contract manufacturing assembly side, mm -hmm. and they, the, the large tier one companies there have, um, uh, huge systems where they, 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 they do not just monitor political events happening uh, across the world, but also even weather events and, mm -hmm. and uh, anything that could potentially disrupt their supply chains. I mean, uh, it's quite a sophisticated system. Uh, are you set up for that type of thing? A absolutely. Mm -hmm. So in that area, we help companies establish what we call risk councils, which mm -hmm. are generally cross-functional. So supply chain, operations, supplier, covering everything from ESG concerns to natural disasters, geopolitical uh, challenges, trade barriers. Mm -hmm. uh, in a lot of areas, we'll partner with some uh, published software providers, such as uh, Resolink. So mm -hmm. we're the primary provider for Resolink in all of the Asia Pacific region, right. specifically to support a lot of that back-end OSAT uh, capability to then help bring those insights uh, as close to near real time to the OEMs mm -hmm. to be able to help them either you know reallocate or reprioritize available supply or be able to re drive effective communications of when they'll be able to support the customers. Right, right, right. Now, I mean, what, one of the big things that's happening in the industry and is, is, is permeating across the industry is, is sustainability. Yeah. Uh, you know, companies are looking to reduce their carbon footprint, they're trying to um, bring things a little bit closer. Uh, are you getting pushed for that? Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. so we, uh, a woman on my team, Deborah Dole, reads our ESG 
environment. She uh, used to be part of Zero 100, which was an analyst firm focused on circular economy. Mm -hmm. um, that's a key aspect of everything we do. So we're right. bringing that into everything from SNOP meetings to start looking at carbon footprint and trade-off. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it goes into the de uh, diversification of the manufacturing network. Mm -hmm. So as some of the geopolitical tensions have heated up and companies had to diversify from any reliance on the PRC, People's Republic of China. Mm -hmm. One of the things is we've identified different manufacturing designs has been also looking at the sustainability from a logistics standpoint, from an infrastructure standpoint, point, reusable water as an example because of the amount of water that's consumed in the semiconductor manufacturing process. Yeah. So yeah. those are key areas that we work uh, both of our clients as well with several governments who have made an effort to uh, either enter or expand their footprint in the semiconductor industry and how they drive funding um, and support for uh, multinational and small uh, companies or you know small medium enterprises inside yeah. of that region. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting area you mentioned. The, 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 one of my earlier interviews today, we were talking about some of the large Taiwanese companies that are looking to relocate down into, um, or not relocate, that's not true, but actually open up other um, factories. Geographically uh, diversified. Geographically diversified. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I only excuse know me. it because I live it. I know, day. I know. But, but, but one of the key concerns is they're looking for places that got obviously uh, copious water supply yeah. and, and, and that sort of thing. And they've been looking uh, at the, the southern tips of, of Mexico where there seems to be a lot of water yeah. uh, uh, to be able to relocate down there so it's an interesting an interesting area. Now I, I believe that later on this week you've got a, a presentation coming up on uh, yeah. heading towards the one trillion dollar economy mm -hmm. you know when I when I first heard that a couple of weeks ago in the, in the semi um, the semi -con west um, uh, promotional materials, yeah. uh, I was taken aback. I was thinking $1 trillion, I could hardly get my head around the number. <laughs> but I mean, um, you're doing a presentation on it, so I I explain to me how you're going to help, uh, what the challenges are, and how you're going to help some of your customers to reach that. Yeah, I mean, obviously since COVID, the expansion and the growth of the semiconductor industry has been unprecedented. Mm. Um, I know a lot of people like to blame the semiconductor industry and say supply chains failed due to COVID. You know, we can debate that at a different time. Reality is the growth of content density, the growth of chip applications, and everything that we use as consumers has just expanded. Mm -hmm. um, and it's proliferated the need for more robust supply chains. Um, while the top companies that you would think of, you know, like the Qualcomm's, the Broadcom's, NVIDIA, AMD's, and mm -hmm. the equipment companies, the LAMs, the Applied Materials, the ASML's, they're capitalized to be able to make that 100 or even 150, 200% growth, you know, by 2030. Right. The challenge that we're seeing a lot of times is their tier one, tier two, tier three suppliers simply are not capitalized at the level that's required to scale. Mm -hmm. So one of the biggest things that we're doing when we're working with some of the leading OEMs in the industry is identify where are those pain points within their value chain outside their four walls that need to be further developed, hardened, and or capitalized to be able to be successful. Right. The other aspect is anytime you're growing that by that growing that much that fast, you have to make a lot of strategic bets on very large and capital intensive projects, mm -hmm. right? And obviously, yeah. you know, the Chips Act got a lot of press and, you know, new fab development and TSMC developing fabs in the US and mm -hmm. Intel's new fabs. Um, those are two year projects. Right, so a lot of our clients are leveraging us for uh, assistance around the analytical aspect of when I'm making those bets, how do I make sure that two and three years ago, A, the bet was big enough, um, but B, it's also right size for the speed of the tech node innovation and new product development that's happening in the industry. Right. And you've got, to, you've got to look at that across the whole supply chain, though, not, not just necessarily the, the, the front end and even the back end semiconductor side. You've got to look across you know, the, the, the assembly, the PCB, the, 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 literally the whole supply the chain. The whole supply chain. A lot of times started all the way back at the end customer, right? Mm -hmm. So looking at like some of the large cloud services providers, right, mm -hmm. for data and storage, what does their growth strategy look like to be able to give an indication of what is the need for compute chips, as an example? Um, and then going all the way through the multiple nodes of the supply chain, you know, down to the raw material components. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's a huge challenge and it's going to be certainly an interesting one. So It's a huge <laughs> challenge and the complexity of it you know, requires a different uh, paradigm for operations. Right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of companies, as they've gone fabulous right, or they've outsourced assembly and tests, OSATs as you mentioned earlier, they've assumed that that's a transactional relationship. I can issue a PO and I receive product. Right. Uh, what COVID has taught us is that that's not the reality. 
right? And, and one of the key things with regards to that is a change from a transactional based relationship to a collaborative based relationship. So we're seeing fabulous companies now shadow planning yield and yield curves of the foundries. We're seeing them also shadow planning and orchestrating and prioritizing OSAT manufacturing capabilities. So the whole nature of the industry mm. has to change. And right. some of the sub-industries such as automotive are further ahead because they felt a lot of the pain. Um, but across all the different industries that the semiconductor companies support, there needs to be a shift from transactional uh, orchestration into collaborative orchestration, which includes both data sharing as well as new governance and organizational design models. Now you're going to sell all this to the bankers. <laughs> <laughs> Bankers play a key role in, in developing capitalized projects, yeah. as everybody is well aware of. <laughs> yeah, well, good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. We'll leave that for like a second second life career path. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's a fascinating time, so an exciting time to be in the industry, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I, uh, it, it's, it's a great story to hear. So I want to thank you very much, Michael, for coming in and just giving us a glimpse of your world today. Absolutely. I appreciate the time. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.